you've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with a Gun Show. This week, I'm going to have a conversation with a new friend from Illinois, Kevin Van Eckeren. Also, Michael J. Williams is going to talk about shot timers for you new timers. And in our history segment, a black man who invented a gun. And in our news feature, the armed citizen. All this coming up on episode number 519 of the Black Man with a Gun Show. This is the Conscientious Weekly Podcast that talks about firearms and things of interest to the gun community. Don't let the name scare you. This is the pro-fun, pro-gun show with history, commentary, news, interviews from all over America. Hi, my name is Ken Blanchard and I've been a gun rights activist since 1991. And you just discovered the show with over 1.7 million downloads with celebrity guests, new products, and good people making a difference. After John Wayne leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance, let's get this party started. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Gunpowder was invented around 1241 AD, most likely by the Chinese. It spread throughout the Middle East and then onto Europe. Gunpowder. Classified as a low explosive. It's what makes the firearm shoot. Black powder. One of the earliest known chemical explosives. But we ain't talking about that right now. The first gun to use gunpowder was probably a handheld cannon by the Chinese. Still in the 12th century. Then we have the Middle East in the 14th century. With something that looks more like a rifle today. And then in Europe as it just continues in the 1300s. Hmm. But we're not talking about that either. So let's move on to the 1800s. Who invented the single-shot rifle, the Winchester 1885? The bolt-action rifle, the Winchester 1900? The slide-action rifles, the Winchester 1890? Recoil-operated semi-automatic rifle, Remington Model 8 and 81? The blowback-operated semi-automatic rifles, Double barrel shotguns, lever action shotgun, slide action shotguns, and should I continue? Winchester 1897, the Remington Model 17, later became the Ithaca 37, the Stevens 520. How about the recoil operated semi automatic shotgun like the Browning Auto 5 and the Remington Model 11? Blowback operated semi automatic pistols, the FNM 1900, the Colt 1903, the 1908 Pocket Hammerless. The FN 1910, the Colt Woodsman. How about the recoil operated semi automatic pistol, the Colt 1902, the Colt 1903 Pocket Hammer, and the USM 1911? How about the FN GP 35 High Power? And we're not even done yet. We're talking about the gas operated machine guns like the Colt M 1895, the USM 1918 BAR, the recoil operated machine guns like the USM 1917, and the M 1919. How about that? US M2 heavy machine gun, an automatic machine cannon, and the Colt Browning 37 millimeter. The dude was a bad dude. Am I right about it? John M. Browning. Mm hmm. But do you know who created the Super Soaker in 1989? A black man by the name of Lonnie G. Johnson. Yeah, the Super Soaker. You know that fun toy that's been copied by a million different ways by the Chinese? Lonnie George Johnson was born October 6, 1949, in Mobile, Alabama. His father was a World War II veteran who worked as a civilian driver at a nearby Air Force base, while his mother worked in a laundry and as a nurse's aide. During the summers, both the Johnson's parents also picked cotton on his grandfather's farm. Out of both interest and economic necessity, Johnson's dad was a skilled handyman who taught his kids to build their own toys. When Johnson was still a small boy, he and his dad built a pressurized chinaberry shooter out of bamboo shoots. I have no idea what a chinaberry shooter is, but I'm going to find out. 
At the age of 13, Johnson attached a lawnmower engine to a go-kart he built from junkyard scraps and raced it along the highway until the police stopped him. Johnson dreamed of becoming a famous inventor and during his teenage years began to grow more curious about the way things worked and more ambitious in his experimentation, sometimes to the detriment of his family. After graduating with Williamson's last segregated class in 1969, Johnson attended Tuskegee University on a scholarship. He earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 1973, and two years later he received a master's degree in nuclear engineering from the school. He was nicknamed the Professor by his friends. Mr. Johnson went on to join the U.S. Air Force, becoming an important member of the government scientific establishment. He was assigned to the Strategic Air Command, where he helped develop the stealth bomber program. Johnson moved on to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 79, working as a systems engineer for the Galileo mission to Jupiter and the Cassini mission to Saturn before returning to the Air Force in 1982. Despite being super busy, Johnson continued to pursue his own inventions in his spare time. One of his longtime pet projects was an environmentally friendly heat pump that used water instead of Freon. Johnson finally completed a prototype one night in 1982 and decided to test it in his bathroom. He aimed a nozzle into his bathtub, pulled the lever, and blasted a powerful stream of water straight into the tub. Johnson's instantaneous and instinctive reaction, since shared by millions of kids around the world ever since, was pure delight. So, in 1989, after another seven years of tinkering and tireless sales pitching, during which he left the Air Force to go into business for himself, Johnson finally sold his device to the Laramie Corporation. The power drencher initially failed to make much of a commercial impact, but after marketing efforts and a name change, the, quote, super soaker became a massively successful item. It topped the 200 million sales in 1991 and went on to annually rank among the world's top 20 best-selling toys. Propelled by the success of the Super Soaker, Lonnie G. Johnson founded Johnson Research and Development and went on to acquire dozens of patents. Some of his inventions, including a ceramic battery and hair rollers that set without heat, achieved commercial success. Others include a diaper that plays a nursery rhyme when it's soiled, failed to catch on. The dude has had his struggles. Hasbro tried to steal his stuff. But in 2013, Johnson received a $73 million settlement from Hasbro which it had acquired Laramie Corporation a decade earlier. Even when he originally approached the toy company to make this thing, they told him don't quit his day job. Yeah. Originally it was 628 millimeters long. The diameter of the water stream was 22.4 millimeters and could reach more than 12 meters. Amazing. Stuff that we just take for granted. You go to a toy store now, you can buy one. Never could give it a second thought. Lonnie G. Johnson. Black man with a water gun. Yeah, I said it. And if you dig into the history of the Super Soaker, you see that there were some tragedies and some sad stories mixed in here, too. As soon as you say gun, that's why I guess you say Super Soaker and not uh, water gun or anything with gun in it, because that's just adult content, right? That's just gun porn. You can't say the word gun. It offends some people. Well, anyway, back in 1992, uh, there was a couple incidents. On one occasion, some kids shot somebody with a Super Soaker, and then he shot back with a real gun. On another occasion, a water fight in Boston escalated into a real gunfight and a teenager was killed. And there was also reports of people using them in weird ways, for example, filling them with bleach instead of water. The mayor of Boston back in the day tried to introduce a voluntary sales ban on the toy. And Mr. Johnson said he got a phone call from a reporter from that city whom, in a most serious and grave voice, told him, We've got a report that super soakers are being used in by drive-by shootings and we're wondering if you have any comment." And he had no idea what to say to him, he said. Well, you know, I think we should have more of that. And of course, further generations of super soakers followed, and he went on to design the in-strike range of Nerf dart guns, which used some of the same compressed air technology. And being a toy that sells year-round, he made even more money, though Nerf guns, and uh, that he did with a super soaker. So, kind of cool. Lives out of Atlanta, Georgia, and he has a scientific facility down there. And in fact, the brother is still inventing. So... Now you know. I actually want to invent a pistol of my own, too. That would be like, that's only one of the few things I have on a bucket list to actually leave as a legacy for humanity is to have my own designed gun. Guess I better get on it, right? It goes on the list with other things I'm trying to do before I leave out of here. 
This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color. Armed Citizen Stories, April 19th, 2017. This is from Lawton, Oklahoma. A man is dead after police say he was shot while trying to break into a woman's home in Lawton. Authorities say it happened around 8.30 at the corner of Southwest 5th and I Avenue. When they got to the scene, they found a man identified as a Rocky Stamper unresponsive. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. Officers took the homeowner to the police department to interview her as their investigation continued. We spoke with a few neighbors to get their reaction to the shooting. Some were shocked and some say they weren't surprised. Just a few minutes after taking her son to school, Hillary, a neighbor, drove home to find her street flooded with cop cars. It's a pretty scary moment, said Hillary. You wonder what's going on a few houses down. And just a month after moving into the neighborhood, she says she's not surprised something happened. She and other residents say they hear noises all the time. Sometimes I think people are shooting off fireworks, said Hillary. They might be shooting guns. It's just kind of panicky, you know. We're fairly new to the neighborhood, so we just try to keep an eye out. Another neighbor was outside his home at the time of the shooting with a few construction workers. They were just feet from getting hit by a bullet that flew right by them. All we heard was like a little puff, and the one guy that knows a lot about bullets and everything said, Wow, that was a shot, said Stauffer. We didn't hear a bang, a big bang or anything like that, and we were trying to figure out where it came from. One of them right away said, Maybe you should call the cops because of little kids in the area. So I did. Mike Stauffer is also aware of the loud noises. It doesn't bother me, but I imagine a bunch of people would be really unnerved about it, you know, said Stauffer. Hillary said this is a wake-up call for her and her family and will be extra cautious from here on out. She's thankful for the law for the local law enforcement that are always keeping an eye out. It makes me feel pretty good knowing that they're there and I see them driving around every now and then so they keep a watch out, said Hillary. The police have not yet released the name of the homeowner, but you can count on your news team to keep you updated as soon as information becomes available. And this article from Guns.com, Alabama Senate passes constitutional carry measure. State senators on Tuesday sent legislation to the House that would allow Alabamians to lawfully carry concealed handguns in the state without a permit. The measure, SB 24, to remove restrictions on Second Amendment rights and bring the state in line with others, could codify constitutional carry as the law of the land passed 26 to 8 along party lines. My goal is to remove unnecessary burdens on law-abiding citizens who own and carry guns since most criminals and thugs don't bother applying for permits anyway, said the bill's sponsor, Senator General Allen, a Republican from Tuscaloosa. What is that? Tuscaloosa. Allen's proposal would keep Alabama's current concealed carry permitting scheme administered through county sheriffs in place, but erase the requirement to obtain such a permit. Permit holders would retain the advantage of being able to buy a gun without an additional background check as well as reciprocal carry in the states that recognize what currently Alabama's permits. Open carry is already legal without a permit. Though SB 24, in the end, passed the Senate with ease, the powerful Alabama Sheriff's Association is against the legislation, with a number of their members being increasingly vocal about their reasons for opposing it, including Pickens County Sheriff David Abstin, who cited loss of revenue, and Etowah County Sheriff Todd Etrican, who feels it's a public safety risk. Allen downplays fears of lost income, saying, quote, you will still need a permit if you're going to legally carry a gun in other states. So I anticipate that a large majority of gun owners in Alabama will continue to purchase a permit from their local sheriff, end quote. The bill is part of the Senate GOP 2017 Strengthen Alabama Legislative Agenda of Tax Cuts and Reform Measures. The proposal now goes to the Republican-controlled House of Representatives for further consideration. Passage there without further amendment would place it on the desk of the state's new governor, Kay Ivey, who assumed office last week 
following the resignation of two-term Governor Robert Bentley. In 2014, while running for Alabama Lieutenant Governor, Ivy received an endorsement of the National Rifle Association, who was supporting SB 24. Here's a tragic story from 4-17-2017 from the TuscaloosaNews.com. Police believe that a 40-year-old man was forced to shoot and kill his father early Monday morning. Archie McDaniel, 82, may have suffered from dementia. He fired shots at one of his sons and was about to shoot his other son, said Tuscaloosa County Metro Homicide Unit Assistant Commander C- Captain Kip Hart. Whew, almost lost it there. Based on everything we know right now, everything appears to have been justified, he said. The trouble started Sunday night when McDaniel threw some items into the yard of his brick home on Hargrove Road East near Woodland Road. His sons live in homes on either side. His younger son, 40, pulled into the driveway to retrieve the items around 6.45 a.m., Hart said. He didn't realize that his father was outside and armed. Mr. McDaniel confronted him with a handgun and threatened to kill him. He fired a shot that grazed him, he said. The older son came outside and attempted to calm his father. Hart said, Mr. McDaniel turned and pointed the weapon at that son, he said. Unfortunately, the other son had to shoot to protect himself and others at the scene. They tried to de-escalate it as best they could, up to a point where they had not given a choice and had to do what they had to do to protect themselves. Deputies arrived to find McDaniel dead in the front yard of the home. Investigators were looking to McDaniel's medical history, and continue to talk with witnesses before presenting the case to a grand jury. They don't expect to charge a son with a crime. My understanding is that there have been some issues with his health and that may have come into play with his judgment, Hart said. That's just sad. And my final story happened Easter Sunday morning. There was a shooting in St. Roque in New Orleans. A 54-year-old man expected to face charges after he pointed a revolver another man who then shot him in self-defense following an argument Easter Sunday in the St. Roach neighborhood in New Orleans, police said in a preliminary report. Police did not say why the man is to be charged. Cornell Brown and the 68-year-old man were arguing with each other in the beginning Sunday night, April 16th. But about 8.25 p.m., Brown left the 1200 block of Spain Street only to return with a revolver, which police said he pointed at the older man. In response, the older man pulled out a gun and shot Brown in the right forearm, police said. Brown was taken to an area hospital for treatment and is expected to be arrested and booked with aggravated assault. The shooter is believed to have fired in self-defense, police said. It was one of two shootings reported to police Easter Sunday. At nearly the same time as the St. Roach shooting, at about a mile and a half away, a 23-year-old man was at a block party in the 2300 block of Allen Street, where he heard gunfire and realized he had been shot. This is according to the NOPD. He was taken to EMS to an area hospital for treatment. And before I forget, let me tell you about the show I called Warrior Cast. It's my newest podcast. It's neat. uh, It's about fitness and health, about fight games and fighting, the mixed martial arts. I'm learning a lot. I'm actually losing some weight by hanging out with these people. Check out podcast.warriorcast.com. Some of the biggest news this week, it's actually still unfolding, is when YouTube started attacking the content creators. When their advertisers, the big ones, started pulling out. AT&T and Johnson & Johnson, among the biggest advertisers in the U.S., were among several companies to say last week that they would stop their ads from running on YouTube and other Google properties amid concern that Google is not doing enough to prevent brands from appearing next to offensive material like hate speech. Somehow, the gun tubers, the pro-gun, the Second Amendment folks, are getting stuck in that too. The companies made moves which did not extend to Google search ads amid boycotts of YouTube by several European advertisers that began a couple of weeks ago. Google had outlined steps it would take to stop ads from running next to hateful, offensive, or derogatory content, according to them, on YouTube and websites in its display network. While Google pledged to improve, brands wanted to hear there would be zero risk that their ads would appear next to content promoting things like terrorism, said uh, Brian Weiser, a media industry analyst at Pivotal Research. From a couple of YouTube guys that I've seen, they said their revenues have been down 92%. 
Another says this is down 80%. I guess when the tide kind of lowered, everybody is taking a hit. I know somebody is looking for, looking at that full 30 to um, be the savior here, but doesn't look like it's going to happen. Even if you would change the platform, Google still owns the search engines, so it's going to be something. Who would have thought? But necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe something will come out of this that we need. Bueller. Bueller. And I think I'm going to most definitely have to tap into my friend's brain power, Hank Strange, who's definitely affected by all this stuff. And that concludes this week's news. This portion of the show has been brought to you by the United States Concealed Carry Association. The USCCA has been providing education, training, and self-defense insurance to responsibly armed Americans since 2003. Join Tim Schmidt and myself here at usconcealedcarry.com. It's time. Time to make that change. Michael J., you're up next, brother. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland of m-wtactical.com, and today we're going to discuss the timer. Through the years of me training and doing various competitions, I have discovered that a timer can be your friend, but can come across as a tool you may stay away from. If you visited my Facebook page and Instagram page, you would see me with my buddy Johnny doing some drills under the timer. When you observe it, you do not see him racing against the clock, but focusing on his movements to get his time down. The clock should not be a factor that contributes to fear. For the past two weeks, we have been talking about a few drills that will get you better under the clock. If you were not able to listen to those shows, Download the Black Man with the Gun app and go back and listen to those tips and work on them. If you want to contact me, feel free to do so. I love talking to those in the audience, especially about firearms and training. You can pick up one of these timers for just a little over 100 bucks. The one thing about me and this timer, I had to play with it for a while to get the true understanding of how it works. Now, for those who are a bit strapped for cash and just don't want to pay that amount for a timer, no worries. Like anything else, there's an app for that. Hit up your smartphone store and do a search for something like USPSA Shot Timer or IDPA Shot Timer and then select what you feel will work best for you. Do understand that the apps are not going to be precise as a regular timer, but It will get you in the ballpark and in enough green area to get some good quality training in. Tune in next week as we tackle another area of marksmanship for another tips and review segment. Thank you for all those who follow and support the M-W Tactical Facebook page. If you haven't done so, look us up on Facebook and hit the like button and join in on the many discussions that are taking place. We are trying to reach our goal of 2,000 likes before the end of the year. Tell your buddies to get on Facebook and hit the like button on the M-W Tactical Facebook page. If you are more into photos, follow me on Instagram at MJ Woodland, where you can get an up-close and personal involvement of my daily life and an involvement at a shooting range. If you would like to read more about us, do so by going to www.m-wtactical.com where you can easily connect with us on any of the previously mentioned social platforms while looking at pictures, viewing future classes, emailing us, or even listening to the current week of the Black Man with a Gun podcast. For those who want a more direct approach, just call us at 803-250-1256 and let's discuss whatever is on your mind from shooting classes or just inviting us out to your upcoming event. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. Thank you, sir. All right, this week on the show, I got a guy who is a venture capitalist. He's from the state of Illinois, Kevin Van Eckren. Welcome to the show, man. Ken, thank you so much for having me on. We're talking about guns this week and the misconceptions and the real deal. What What do you think is the real big picture behind what's going on in the world? I think that right now what, what we see is people are so um, concerned about 
guns because it's the only thing they think they can change in our society to prevent violence. When in reality, I mean, look, if you look at the statistics, we have 350 million people. We have 300 million guns. We have no idea who owns what gun. And so it is impossible to confiscate guns, not just because of our constitution, because it would just be impossible. And so everyone that is saying we need to put all these restrictions in place um, is kind of not thinking about the bigger picture and saying that we need to change society to make it a safer place instead of changing the uh, the one thing they see as the problem, which is the gun itself. So true. Are you a gun guy yourself? I am. I am. I've been a... Uh, a guy that carries a gun most of my life since uh, 2009. Um, and thankfully, it has saved my life twice. And thankfully, I've never had to hurt anyone. But it is something that without it, I may very well have been put in some very, very dangerous situations. So to me, it feels like this is the, the thing that people that choose to carry a gun should have the right to carry a gun. Absolutely. Unfortunately, a couple of times you're Sound just bugged right out, but I, oh. but we caught that we caught most of that violence violence in Chicago, not the whole yes. state of Illinois, but it's it's always in the news. They almost paint your state as if Chicago was the state. It is unfortunate, and it is mostly because unfortunately, especially recently, because they're not allowing the police to do their jobs. Um, right now, a Chicago police officer has to. Uh, fill out a uh, a form that takes 45 minutes just because they want to talk to one person on the street. And so Say what? that means, yeah, it's insane. And so basically police officers have stopped interacting with the community, and that means that there has been a rash. And I mean, you know, we went from – 500 some odd shootings to 700 some odd shootings in one year just because of that. And, and it's just, it's a scary thing in Chicago that it, it hurts me because I'm, I'm from this area. So you got the whole rest of the state though, which is beautiful, has farmland, big open plains. And absolutely. And, and as a whole, Illinois is a very safe place, but some parts of Chicago aren't quite that way. It's been a political issue, too. I mean, I remember when I was there a couple of times doing rallies and stuff. We we're talking about the Daily Machine and the politics of the past. Is that still in place? It is in many ways. Um, unfortunately, there is, you know, Illinois is the most corrupt state in the nation, and it is it is prevalent, unfortunately. I mean, what, why else would either two or three of our governors be in prison right now, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Um, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate thing for sure. And, and also that's why they call it the Windy City. It's not because it's windy. It's because of all the hot air leaving the politicians' mouths. <laughs> <laughs> so what, can, what can a regular citizen do in Chicago or in Illinois, for that matter, to take care of the violence, to just look at a different way to look? I think that the the biggest thing we need to do in Illinois is start looking at how we can change our culture to allow everyone to be safer. And one of the biggest things we can do is get the right politicians in to, and, and you know make our votes really count. And especially in local elections, those votes count in a big way. So we need to find those politicians that are looking at the bigger picture and not just saying that – the gun or the knife or the a, a certain area of, of a city is the problem, but instead looking at how we can change the entire culture, um, get rid of institutional racism and all those other things that have led to the place we are today and instead realize that we need to better our education system and to stop taking money away from things that really matter to, to just take care of the problems of today. We need to focus on what's what's really going to make a difference in 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. That's always hard because nobody wants to invest in the future if they can't get an ROI tomorrow. I mean, it's just a weird thing that we do. It's Well, look, I mean, I think it's a product of, of the fact that these days we have an attention span of two seconds. And so we traditionally want to see how we can make a difference tomorrow, not next year, next 
decade. And and we really need to start thinking in a different way in order to, to fix these problems we have. What can, what can a, a regular person do other than, okay, we, you said the politicians have to vote some good people in. Is there anything they can do in the meantime until next election? I think the other thing that, that people need to do is really take a deep dive on what they're concerned about. So if you're concerned about guns, go out and do the research and understand understand that, for example, um, are, are police officers the problem? I, and look, as someone that owned and operated a company that trained SWAT teams nationwide for six years, I can definitively tell you there are some bad cops out there. But the vast majority of cops are good, and they really do want to help, and they are not racist. And so how? So we need to really look at, are the police the problem, or is it the fact that we're teaching them that the police are the problem that is the problem does that make sense yeah perception is reality we can kind of put stuff before and put it in people's heads already absolutely yes i was trying to tell somebody can that I, can i also wanted to say yeah go ahead sorry i just i just want to say that a lot of the the interviews you're doing a lot of things you're talking about are so relevant on, on this podcast to what's going on in our society and i wanted to thank you so much for for giving those people a voice. It's so important in today's society. Oh, thanks, man. I really do appreciate it. Training SWAT team people, what, what does that entail? So um, I joined a SWAT team as a civilian, as a logistics officer, and um, I noticed that the guys were saying that they wanted equipment. And so I, I got them the equipment, uh, through grant writing and private donations and that kind of thing, and then I and then I kept seeing them do the really stupid things like walking in between an armored vehicle that was meant to stop bullets and the gunman instead of being behind the armored vehicle or in the armored vehicle. And so I I got them training, and I realized that training is not about how to pull a trigger, as everyone thinks. It's Training them to think outside the box, training them to think in a in a scary life and death scenario. How can I save my life and my brother's lives and also make sure that anyone else involved, civilian and suspect alike, is the least likely to be hurt? And the more it is proven over and over again that the more you train a police officer, the less likely they are to use excessive force. And so I started the company to train SWAT teams because I felt it is so necessary to do that. So we would go out to um, police departments across this nation and understand their problems and then spend five to seven days going through the things that – to teach them how to think outside the box and how to critically think about the situation they're in so to have the best resolution for everyone. And, and it was a very positive experience for me. We ended up training thousands of police officers in that time. And I have many letters and, and emails from people saying, thank you so much for your training today. I was in a deadly encounter and it saved my life and the lives of my brothers. And that's really why I did it. It was, it was a powerful experience that I'm so glad I, I undertook. Oh, that's cool, man. Mindset is everything. It really is. It really is. And I think the the biggest thing, you know, you, you bring up the term mindset, and that's the biggest thing that we taught, um, but, but also it's, it's stress inoculation. So many people go on a flat range, and they shoot, and they think they know how to shoot, but you lose those skills when you're being shot at, when right. you're running, and, and all that other stuff. And so we put those people in, the safe, in a safe position so they wouldn't get hurt, but we amped their adrenaline up so that they had to use those fine motor skills in those encounters so that they could function in a life or death scenario in an effective way. That's the only way to train. You got to train like you want to live. My man, you said it right. Yeah, that, that's it. Wow. SWAT team trainer. Venture capital. It was a lot of fun. How'd you make that jump? Well, I started, I started a few companies, including Fulcrum Tactical and uh, it was it was a lot of fun to you know any day you get to shoot stuff and blow stuff up and you get paid is a good day right 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 but <laughs> but I also 
um, started several other companies, both that succeeded and failed. And I certainly learned more from my failures than my successes. But at the end of the day, what I realized is that in order for me to have the best outcome, it doesn't make any sense to put all my my dollars and my time into one pot, into one company. And so now I invest in uh, seed and Series A companies um, throughout the country that do anything from restaurants and fashion all the way through to uh, tactical applications and products and services, um, both for, for businesses and um, consumers. So we try and kind of spread that out and diversify so we can guarantee a return. You know what? You made me think of something. I bet mindset's important in that too, isn't it? It absolutely is. One of the biggest things that I learned working with the police is that um, understanding your own bias and um, analyzing that bias and, and doing the research to figure out whether that bias is correct is the best mindset to have in this business. And so I spent a lot of time researching everything I could about all the areas that we invest in so I have the right mindset and I and my entire team has the right mindset so we can make the the a rational and logical investment. Because entrepreneurs are like, just a, a personality that's going to go, 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 but it could be going in the wrong direction at the same time. All the time, all the time. And, and you know, you to be an entrepreneur, inherently you have to be a big risk taker. And so often as investors, it is our job to slow them down a little bit, make them think a little bit more about their decisions, and make sure that they're making the right decision for not just themselves, but all the people they employ. Sounds like a range coach to me. <laughs> in many ways it is unfortunately however um when when someone's holding a gun usually they've been trained to do so and many entrepreneurs have not been trained and so there is a challenge in that as well yeah yeah i see that right now cuz i even took some of my failures as a negative like it's really hard to 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 keep it in a positive light people say man you you just keep trying stuff and that's the only way I'm going to learn. I, I can tell immediately when something's not going to go, so I know to drop it. But they're like, shouldn't you have stuck with it longer? What do you say to, to people like me? Am I, am I on the wrong track, or what do you think? I think that um, the, the one thing that is consistent throughout business is persistence is the ultimate thing that leads to success. But I also completely agree with you that if you don't see traction – early on, it's going to be a very hard road. And especially in this very cluttered landscape of thousands of businesses being started every month, you have to find the thing that's going to connect with your consumer the, uh, the, in the most efficient way. And so you have to be able and willing to say, you know what, I was wrong. I'm going to drop that or I'm going to pivot and move this to something else that makes more sense for the consumer. Yeah, I, I move like a quarterback on a football team. <laughs> well, no clearly idea. you're doing something right. <laughs> okay. Because this podcast is awesome. Oh, man, thank you. How can folks reach you, Kev? So you can uh, reach me at um, on Twitter at Fulcrum Investing. Uh, you can also uh, go to FulcrumInvesting.com, and I'd also encourage them to uh, listen to my podcast, The State of Logic. Outstanding, the state of logic. I'm gonna make sure I get a link to that. Awesome, I appreciate it. Got to cross pollinate, man. I totally agree. We have to work together in this industry. It's the it's the way of nature. It works in real life too. That's right, absolutely. Well, man, thank you. I'm gonna actually have to have you back on again and uh, and pick your brain on some stuff. If that's okay. Oh, anytime, whenever you want. I look forward to it. All right, man. This was Kevin Van Eckeren from Venture Capitalist. He is from Fulcrum investing and i'm gonna yes. get, get my tongue together so i can say fulcrum with some power there <laughs> but kevin thank you brother thank you and have a wonderful day you do the same hey thinking about suicide i'm here to tell you that you're not alone if you need some help in the u.s please call 1-800-273-8255 
Fine. That's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. SuicidePreventionLifeline.org 1-800-273-8255 You are not alone. But if you want to talk to me first, my email address is blackmanwithagun at gmail.com and all my contact information can be found at blackmanwithagun.com I'm here for you. I want to thank you first and foremost for listening, downloading, and supporting this podcast. If there's something that I said or that you heard on the show that made a difference in your life that you liked that you want to share, please do. This thing wouldn't move if it wasn't for you. You know, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects the change. But the leader in us adjusts the sails. Just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next week, this is your friend and your brother, Ken Blanchard. Shalom, baby. This show is part of the Gun Podcast Network.